The term service mesh was practically coined by the team behind Linkerd, who emerged from Twitter and later founded the company Buoyant. From the early days of Twitter's Finagle RPC stack, Linkerd has undergone several iterations, and a corresponding service mesh ecosystem with many other implementations has rapidly evolved alongside this too. Service mesh technology is obviously still young, and the ecosystem is still very much a work in progress, but there have been several recent interesting developments within this space. One of these was the announcement of the Service Mesh Interface, commonly referred to as SMI, at the recent KubeCon EU in Barcelona. SMI seeks to unlock the Service Mesh integrators and implementers, as this provides a common abstraction that removes the need to bet on any single Service Mesh implementation. This can be good for both toolmakers and enterprise early adopters. Many organizations are involved working alongside the community to help define the SMI, including Buoyant. Hello, I'm Daniel Bryant, co-host of the InfoQ podcast, news manager here at InfoQ, and product architect at DataWire. And I recently had the pleasure of sitting down with Oliver Gold, who's the co-founder and CTO of Buoyant. Oliver has a strong technical background in networking, architecture, and observability, and has worked on solving associated problems at both Yahoo and Twitter. Oliver is a regular presenter at cloud and infrastructure conferences, and alongside his co-founder, William Morgan, you can often find him in the hallway track, waxing lyrical about service mesh and trying to bring others along on the journey too. In this podcast, we summarize the evolution of the service mesh concept with a focus on three pillars, visibility, security, and reliability. We explore the new traffic tap feature within Linkerd that allows near real-time in-situ querying of metrics, and we discuss how to implement network security by leveraging the primitives like service accounts that are provided by Kubernetes. We also discuss how reliability features, such as retries, timeouts, and circuit breakers, are fast becoming table stakes for infrastructure platforms. We also cover the evolution of the service mesh interface, explore how service meshes may impact development and platforms in the future, and briefly discuss some of the benefits offered by the Rust language in relation to building a data plane for Linkerd. We conclude the podcast with a discussion of the importance of community building, and I personally have learned a lot by watching Oliver and the Buoyant team build a fantastic community in support of Linkerd. I think there's many things to learn from this, and also the rest of Oliver's thoughts too. So welcome to the InfoQ podcast, Oliver. Nice to have you on board. Hi, Daniel. So I think it's been pretty much exactly a year since you last chatted to my colleague, Wes. Then there was like kind of service mesh concept just evolving. Now I think the space has evolved even further. Quite a few organizations, quite a few open source projects jumping into the service mesh space. What have you been up to? What do you think about this? Is it good? Uh, so I guess about a year ago, we were just about to launch Linkerd 2 officially. I think that happened September of last year. And so, yeah, it's been a pretty wild ride over the last year of being in production and seeing that actually take off and us starting to pick up momentum kind of in the post-conduit world of Linkerd 2. Very cool. So I, literally this morning, it was perfect timing. I got an email about Linkerd 2.5. Uh, can you give us the kind of like high level stuff and look to be some very interesting kind of new features, some potentially like upcoming features too? Yeah, so I mean, as with all Linkerd releases, we are factoring in a whole bunch of user feedback and bug reports in the last couple of releases. One of the big things we've been hearing is, you know, we have lots of observability features. We have really good Prometheus support. We have TAP, which is kind of a diagnostic and on-demand request tapping feature. And we want to make those things securable. And so we have a secure data plane. We do automatic MTLS between proxies. And we want to start doing that in the observability plane as well, in the kind of control plane. And so we've started to secure all the tap communications. So an arbitrary container can't start tapping requests. That's all tied in through RBAC. And the dashboard's even aware of it. And so really just doubling down on the features that we have and making it production ready for people who have production needs. Very interesting, because you did a great talk at QCon New York, sort of diving into what the service mesh concept is. One thing I really liked is you mentioned there was three pillars in service mesh, and you said visibility, reliability, and security. That's right. And I think anyone who's worked in like software can totally get those are really important, particularly for kind of enterprise production use cases, as you mentioned. Could we dive into each of those a little bit more in depth? You've already talked about the tap feature of visibility. I think that sounds super interesting. Yeah, so observability is definitely our starting point. And the idea there is that as you go into an environment like Kubernetes, things are actually a lot harder to understand. And you have a bunch of information about the nodes and the containers, but now we're talking over the network and we really have to make that debuggable. If you're moving into a microservice architecture and you're throwing in all these you know, Kubernetes pieces and load balancers and, and service meshes, and it's not more debuggable, it's going to be awful to maintain. And so our, our theory there is that we just have to start there and make that awesome. 
And that has to be kind of why you use the service meshes to make your system visible. And then from there, once you have that, you can start to do a lot more interesting features. But you can't talk about securing something until you can talk about how you measure that and how you make it auditable, and et cetera. So starting with Prometheus out of the box was a big thing we learned in Conduit, that having the Prometheus model is very important to us. So we tie labels in through the Kubernetes metadata so we can do kind of arbitrary Prometheus queries about Kubernetes resources and the traffic flowing through them. And then we've written into some new features like TAP, which are ways for us to on-demand request metadata out of the proxies. So where you might use logging and Splunk before to send all of your logs to a thing and then query it after the fact, you can actually do on-demand queries without spending all that money to store all of your logs forever. <laughs> <laughs> nice. With the TAP functionality, what's the UX like there? Of it? Is it a CLI tool or is it going to be some kind of UI on it, some web interface perhaps? Yeah, so actually the Linkerd UI leverages TAP right now in ways you may not know. So when you go see, um, we have like a top ends point dashboard that's kind of dynamic where we show success rate per endpoint. And that all uses TAP data where the dashboard is at the time using TAP to do an on-demand aggregation without using any Prometheus stuff. And so th there are some ways that we should surface that immediately. But yeah, you can use Linkerd TAP as a CLI command and it'll just dump a big stream of text that you can grep on and start to do ad hoc queries. I think there's a lot of opportunity to make that UX much richer. If there's any students out there that want to do a GSOC program next summer or something. <laughs> <laughs> nice pitch. <laughs> Excellent. What about the TLS aspect, the security aspect? Because I'm guessing you're having to decrypt traffic on the fly. There's obviously security implications for that as well. Yeah. So a lot of what we've tried to do here is not to introduce more things to think about, right? So in the same way that the visibility is just kind of on by default and you get it by virtue of deploying the mesh without extra configuration, uh, just by kind of adding an annotation to your pod, MTLS needs to work the same way where you can't be stuck in a long kind of thinking about what is SNI and how do I name things? It can be quite complex. You know, on the open web, it's pretty complex and dealing with CSLRs and, you know, all the CA infrastructure. And so our goal was to make it one tied to Kubernetes identity. We didn't want to have to do identity attestation and bootstrapping outside of the Kubernetes model. And that allows us to use things like service tokens, which are improving over the next couple of Kubernetes releases. To bootstrap identity, we generate TLS certs in the pods so the keys never leave the pods. And it's a pretty nice automatic model. It's not 100% right now. So right now it just deals with HTTP traffic to a Kubernetes service where the link is on both sides of that connection. But in 2.7, we're working towards making that ubiquitous to cost all TCP communication as long as link is on both sides of the thing. We'll make sure it's MTLS. And that will make it you know, so that you can validate and make auditing decisions, et cetera. We're less focused on authorization, which is kind of the policy side of that right now. There's That's part of the SMI spec that we've been working on with other folks there is to identify what that way of setting policy is, but that's still evolving. And ultimately, I see that as kind of a, a later need, where the, the first need is, again, understanding what's going on in the network, being able to have strong identity, being able to trust that things are secure, and being able to audit whether they're secure or not. If I'm worried about authorization before I can do those things, I'm kind of putting the cart before the horse. Yeah, that totally makes sense. One thing I have seen quite a bit of buzz around recently is OPA, the Open Policy Agent. Yep. I'm guessing that might be some kind of like in the future, perhaps with the SMI connection as well. That's right. And I know there's a talk in the works about Linkerd and Gatekeeper integration. And Gatekeeper is a project that does some OPA kind of policy as you deploy. And so that can be used for enforcing PSPs, et cetera. So I definitely see there's a lot of things active in that space. But it, it seems like a pretty mature need for most organizations that are really just trying to get up and running in Kubernetes at the point. Yeah, I mean, we constantly see that. And I've got, I've got a few questions later on around sort of complexity in general. The other pillar um, of around reliability. I mean, I guess that's kind of table stakes these days. You've been talking, and William and many folks from Point have been talking about, say, circuit breakers and retries for a long time now. Is there anything new in that space with reliability? There's nothing really, I mean, there's improvements, you know, so we slowly improve our load balancer as we test it more and things like that. But I don't think there's any huge breakthroughs in that space. It is kind of table stakes. But where it's really important is because the mesh kind of sits in between the platform owner, the person who's basically owns Kubernetes in the organization and the application owners who are deploying things, that reliability being in the platform owner's space there is really important. And because that kind of mesh proxy sits in the platform owner's control, it's something they're providing to the application owner. It's part of the offering of the platform, right? So if you're offering Kubernetes to your users, you don't want them worrying about service discovery and 
retries and all these things necessarily. You kind of want that to be built into the system. So we try to expose that for the platform owners to as much automatically as possible. Totally makes sense. Yeah. So while I was at QCon New York, I also got a chance to sit down with Matt Klein, our creator of Envoy and sort of definitely a thought leader in that space like yourself. He was talking around the CNCF working group that spun up around the universal data plane. Now, I know like I've chatted to you in the past and, and we also have Matt that sort of the data plane is very much a commodity piece of the stack, but there's some drive around having some kind of standard API, something lower than SMI, which we'll cover later on, but some kind of data plane, some kind of proxy API. Is that something yourself, Buoyant, LinkedIn are looking into as well? Actually, not at all. We, we kind of see the universal data plane APIs as the inverse of SMI, where SMI is upward focused towards the kind of users and integrators, consumers of a service mesh, where something like the universal data plane is for someone implementing a service mesh. And we, we have our own internal APIs, but our goal for Linkerd is not to be generic over proxies. We really want to have end-to-end control of the experience there. And so we do different things in our data plane than other data planes do, uh, like automatic protocol detection, the Prometheus stats that have been out of the box for a while. And so having kind of tight control that where we can iterate the whole product together without having to have barriers there is really important for us. And I think it shows that you look at the way the various service meshes have evolved. They are dealing with friction between those pieces, between the, you know, Istio is spending a lot of time rewriting the metrics for Envoy or, you know, dealing with a lot of latency issues. And they're, they're not Envoy's fault or Istio's fault. They're this integration piece. And so we're focused on like that decoupling is not important for us, basically. Yeah, it totally makes sense. One thing I keep hearing from yourselves and, and William and other folks from at LinkerD is very much the focus on production use cases, getting stuff out there, seeing how it's working and taking that feedback. I think that's a really, and I'm not saying others aren't doing that, but I just think that is a really critical step in almost anything in this space, getting that feedback. Yeah, I mean, I think we have a very specific philosophy for not only product development, but software engineering in general. You know, I come from the, you know, BSD, Unix backgrounds of of, uh, worse is better. And so we're focused on making things that are are usable over being kind of specified and correct. So rather than starting with standards and building up to that standard, our goal is to find something that's going to scratch an itch in your workflow and make it so that you don't have to go solve problems for yourself, right? And there's so much in the space where it's easy to add complexity. And if we can just add a couple tools that part that complexity and let you see through to your system and operate a little better, then let's focus on that and let's expand that. And so that's really the Linkerd's philosophy, like start with that kernel of usefulness, observability, and then grow that until we can do all the things that you need, but not to start with this very wide approach of, okay, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and then you'll ride with us as we solve all those problems. Yeah, that makes sense, definitely. Just taking a slight turn now, looking at some of the other features I see, I see a lot of chatter around multi-cluster support. So I guess the idea being for the more advanced users here that they have, you know, in the enterprise workspace, you definitely have more than one Kubernetes cluster. You've probably got some VMs, some legacy, these kind of things. Are you doing much work in that space around being able to support multiple clusters? Yeah, I mean, I, I, one, I don't think it's just big enterprises that care about this. I think every Kubernetes user is using more than one cluster. I have a laptop cluster and a dev cluster and a product cluster, right? We all have more than one. And so I think it's on top of everyone's minds in the space right now. How do we think about federation and multi-cluster? And I think that leads us to some interesting things in the mesh. And it, where my philosophy on the run this whole thing is that I want to build into Kubernetes and I don't want the mesh to be something that has to abstract over Kubernetes and be this thing that bridges Kubernetes APIs, for instance. So I'm hoping that we can lean on Kubernetes SIGs to solve a bunch of this problem. Hopefully, how do we replicate data sets of pods and things like that across clusters and make them discoverable via DNS, et cetera. That doesn't have to be solved in Linkerd. In fact, you know, the more things that are Kubernetes standards that we can integrate with, the better. For instance, why we use service account tokens for identity, et cetera. Yeah, very interesting. A couple of other things I see floating around is things like supporting other protocols, and even say message-driven or event-driven protocols. Is that something that Linkerd would be looking at as well? Yeah, I mean, we've been doing, well, one, because we've written our own data plan, we've been doing a lot of infrastructure work to get the frameworks to be able to add these things. So if you look into the Rust ecosystem, we have Tokyo and Tower, which are the kind of manifestation of a lot of that work. And now that's kind of hitting a maturity point. It has in the last few months where we've been able to move the proxy a little bit more aggressively in that direction. 
And so we're starting that work by adding MTLS and everything and, and getting that identity kind of laid into non-HTTP protocols before we go expand the protocol surface area. But that's definitely on the roadmap. We have a GSOC student who's prototyped a Kafka codec in the proxy, which I'm really excited about. I don't think that's going to merge immediately, but yeah, that's all on the roadmap, but it's a process to get there. We have other priorities first, maybe is the way to put it. Yeah. Another closely related thing I see a lot of people chat about, and Christian Posters and some fantastic writing in this space, is around the enterprise use cases for things like integration. It's, it's all on, on top of people's mind. How do you connect one system to another? People are sort of conflating sometimes service mesh with ESB, things like that. What's your take on that? Do you think, say, service mesh will be a hard cutoff at the kind of platform level, and then there'll be other products like Apache Camel or whatever that build on top of that? So I, I think I have, again, a very weird view of this. And my hope is that Kubernetes eats the world. And, and I mean that. And I hope that we learn how to extend Kubernetes to talk about these systems in kind of fundamental primitive ways, rather than have to have a service mesh for all that cost. And so we see some of the other service meshes doing this. You know, I want to build an abstraction over other schedulers and environments. And, and we really, really do not want to do that. I'm really adamant about avoiding that. <laughs> I could definitely see you very, being very pro-Kubernetes. Yeah, that's the place we're all building around. So we shouldn't be forcing a bunch of these kind of core infrastructure decisions into a bunch of other projects. That These should be things that are opinions held by Kubernetes, I think. Nice. What do you think the biggest pain point is for enterprises adopting things like Kubernetes, things like service mesh, that kind of stuff? The people, right? I mean, it's always the management and, and the teams and, and how they structure these projects. Though, you know, we see a lot of projects that are very successful at moving one team over at a time, but those tend to be very long projects and you have to be comfortable running in a kind of bimodal world where you have a bunch of old infrastructure and a bunch of new infrastructure. Some companies are much better at mandating people moving, and that usually comes down to having really good CI, CD practices where users are kind of decoupled from deploy processes. But no one solved this. Everybody in the space is in the first baby steps of doing it. And the people who are rushing headlong, like I have some friends at Twitter who are uh, part of their Kubernetes migration, and they are going to do it and they're going to do it quick, but they're going to do a lot of work to get there. And it's going to be a lot of customized stuff that does not look like any other Kubernetes cluster. And so I, I think we're figuring out what mature Kubernetes looks like right now. Interesting. Do you think that the platform is quite complex for a typical developer these days? Because when I started writing code, like back in the Java days, I literally wrote my Java code in an IDE. I kind of built my jar and I shipped it onto an app server. These days, I don't do as much development as I like, but even when I do, I'm building containers, I'm putting you know, YAML files here. Do you think we might regress back to a simpler developer experience in the future? Or I mean, I'm sure we will. I, it seems like a, you know we have serverless things that are kind of floating through now, uh, open fast and Knative things in that realm. So I, I'm sure there will be abstractions that get built up and we've kind of torn down the platforms and said passes are bad and we have to go to orchestrated environments. And now we're kind of coming back and saying, well, platforms are really good. It's the same cycle over again. But I think, well, what, what I hope is that we find that there's a set of things that are going to be custom in every organization and those things should not be commoditized into infrastructure. However, so much of this infrastructure stuff kind of can be pulled out of the organizational domain and doesn't need to be a organization or by organization decision. And so things like monitoring, right, are being pulled out in that way where five years ago, everyone was building their own monitoring stacks. What role do you think something like Linkerd will play in this kind of serverless world? Will it be the glue between functions, between services? Yeah, I mean, the, hard, the data plane should be very boring, but what, why it's there is to light it up with you know, visibility and security and reliability. And so... Us having good pipes there that are able to do that, I think, are really important. You know, I don't think Linkerd is the end of the road in terms of functionality. You need to build a good platform. It's just a vital component, filling a bunch of gaps that would be there if you didn't have it. Moving tack a little bit now to the service mesh interface. We touched on it briefly earlier. I think this is super interesting. I saw it you know, announced at KubeCon. I saw you've done some talks on it already. What's your take on SMI? When it first pitched to me, I, I didn't understand it um, at first. I was like, who, who is this for? Is this for is this for us? Are we doing this for ourselves? Are we doing this for our users? Who is this for? As I've talked to a lot more people about it who cared a lot more about it than I expected to, it's dawned on me and, me and why it's useful. And many of us have been working on service meshes for the last couple of years and, and building a bunch of opinions individually and building APIs. And so SMI was a chance for us to sit down with HashiCorp and Microsoft, at least, and kind of think through, well, We've both done traffic split. 
if we were going to put together a simple Kubernetes-centric API for that, what would that look like? And that fell out of it very naturally. And then we, we did a kind of similar exercise with authorization. And I think there's still some iterations we want to do on these things. But that's how I think standards get written, is you, you implement it, you play around with it, you learn lessons from your users, and then you agree on it as a community, rather than kind of, here's an implementation, let's all go run with it, which is you know another way that you can do things. What's your thought of the trade-off around say, vendor-driven specs or end-user specs. I did notice, and I think, you know, I don't really have an opinion per se, but I did notice that a lot of people involved in SMI are vendors in the space, Buoyant, HashiCorp, Microsoft. Is there a sort of trade-off there between that versus, say, something from the grassroots? I mean, that's a good point. I, I think we were in position to kind of make an easy decision. I did there, like, especially on traffic split, there wasn't a whole lot of discovery to go do. We just kind of like, here's our opinion. Let's put together a prototype, basically, and see if people can integrate with it. And so I still think you can't ask people what they want. You'll get a faster horse. You, you got to kind of show them something, right? You got to like show them something and get them to try it. So, you know, I'm sure all the SMI things will iterate in versions and, you know, it'll progress as we learn more things. But it's like a bit a healthy way for us to unlock integrators, right? So I think a lot of people look at the service mesh space and they say, oh, well, I have to bet on one. I have to pick like, which horse am I going to bet on here? And that either means you're going to bet where the marketing dollars are, or you're going to wait and see what happens. And what SMI does is like, look, you don't have to wait to figure out which one you want to integrate around. If you want to start building a CI/CD pipeline, integrate around the traffic split API, and just trust that whatever service mesh you end up with is going to be able to scratch that itch for you. And I, I think that as a way of assuring users that there's a path forward and, and that they're not betting on a kind of long-term bet for a pretty small decision, that's very powerful. And I didn't really appreciate that at first, how useful that would be to people. Yeah, I guess the devil's advocate kind of argument is always the lowest common denominator thing. It's been pitched around with Ingress. We did see that a bit, to be fair, with Kubernetes Ingress. But I mean, Kubernetes was very young when that emerged. Do you think there's a potential for SMI to get stuck on the lowest common denominator? Sure. I mean, Ingress will will rev, right? There'll be another Ingress API. And to Brendan's point, Ingress is actually very successful because it's, I mean, how many Ingresses are there? As an implementer, I found it very frustrating to, to write Ingress implementations, but that, that's a different story. So I think it would be a problem if SMI is afraid to rev its revisions and, and go forward and say, okay, we'll do a, a next version of this thing. And I think that's probably the problem with Ingress is that it got launched and then there was no more, okay, what's next? And all of these things are, are, are basically never finalized. We're going to have roadmaps for them and they may get paused and pick back up again. But, so traffic split, I think we're good with. Authorization, we'll have a longer roadmap, uh, revving that some more. And we'll see what other APIs come out of the woodwork as we go forward. Very nice. So it's final couple of questions, Oliver. What are you personally most excited about and working on now? I know you do a lot of work in Rust, for example. You mentioned like the Tokyo and, and Tower Library, super interesting stuff. When you wake up in the morning and you go, yeah, I love what I do. What's the first thing in your mind when you think of that? That's an amazing question. I think that changes a lot. Going back to your first question too, about you know a year ago we last talked and, and how much has changed. One of the things I really enjoy is making technical bets, and it's, it can be very long until you get any validation around those things. And so making bets around Rust, for instance, there have been times in the process where I feel like everyone who told me this is a bad idea is right, and man, this is so much work, where are we going? And then you hit a milestone, and you look back at how much has changed since you felt that way, and you're like, oh, this is great. We've made a bunch of great technical decisions. we built a great framework here, and we feel like we can really enable ourselves to move more freely now. And so that kind of long-term success of a project, being able to see where a year ago with Link32 kind of just launching and now seeing the kind of big fans we have of the project, the people are really excited when we release, like that long-term growth is what really motivates me at the moment. Not kind of the short-term, oh my God, we got this release out, the long-term, oh, we got five releases out this year and everyone's been successful as far as users are concerned. That's kind of where I'm at. I kind of hear you a lot talk about community. I think you've built a fantastic community. And that, I know personally, takes a lot of effort to do, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm talking to people every morning at 7 a.m. when I wake up because they're in other time zones and you know the other end of the day too. But you know we're here to make people successful. And, and being part of that is a lot of times just listening to them and hear their problems and like be like, yep, that's a hard bug. Let's talk about this together. And that's what I like doing with my team here at Buoyant. And I, I'm glad that we get to do that with a whole bunch of people all over the world. Awesome. Well, thanks for your time, Oliver. I really appreciate that. Thanks.